Welcome, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show, where we try to make sense of the real estate market by looking at numbers, looking at trends. Not only will you be well-armed with information, but you will be a hit at all the cocktail parties. So go ahead and smash that like button. And when you do, that means that the temperature will be 75 degrees today. Um, I can't explain the connection, but that's what happened. So today we're going to talk about the Arizona real estate taxes. We're going to kind of compare them to California since 19% of you are from California, 19% of our buyers right now. And, uh, you know, Arizona's blaming you guys for everything. So, you know, buckle up. <laughs> so I'm going to start by kind of taking a look at our inventory numbers today. And then we're going to walk through some of the taxes. And then we're going to look at some of the data beyond that. So let's jump right in. We've only got 4,400 listings today on the market. And you can see there with the blue line being number of listings and the red line being number of homes under contract. See how it spiked up there? The reason it comes up when you track these daily is you'll see that people will put a home on the market and they'll list it like Friday and then they'll say all offers will be reviewed Monday at 5 o'clock. So they review them Monday. They start hitting the books on Tuesday and Wednesday. So that's why the number of homes that are sold under contract tend to go up on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Or they tend to go down on Monday when you look at the numbers, but then Tuesday and Wednesday they spike back up. I put a little yellow arrow here because this is last year. It's almost identical. So you can see that our listings are slightly higher at 44.61 than they were last year, which were sitting at 42.35. So difference of about 400 units and uh, not enough, unfortunately, not enough to make a difference. So um, away we go. We continue. So how is how are property taxes assessed in Arizona? Well, you know, in California, they have Proposition 13. So they have a limit of uh, 1%. Um, and we have the same limit, but, you know, growth. Uh, but in California, the big difference is your taxes are assessed on the purchase price. So if you bought that thing for 350000 a few years ago, and now you sell it for 900000 you go in and buy it for 900000 your new tax rate is based on the purchase price, not on the assessed value. So that really stings. That's not the case in Arizona. So that's good to know, right? So it's based on the assessed value. So let me walk through and show you kind of how it goes. And I'm going to show you an actual example of a, just a basic Gilbert home here. And when you look here, this is one that shows 2019 final, 2020 final, 2021, and this year and next year are preliminary on the assessments. So let's look at 2021, shall we? This home here shows a, a full cash value of 193,300, land at 48,000, and then it gives you a total assessed uh, F FCV total of 241,000, 6%. Then it's got an LPV total. Well, what is this? So what Arizona does is they look and they say, okay, so um, we're going to give you this assessed value, and then we're going to have a calculation at 10% of that. So that 10% works out to 22400 And in this case, it works out to where it's only about point, I think it's uh, 0.87. So let me kind of walk you through a real live uh math example here. I'll pull out my little calculator. So let's take a $300,000 house. The cash value is, or the uh, the value is going to be 10% of that. So it's going to be $30,000. And our tax rate goes from either 0.87 to 1.3% in total. Now, when I say in total, that means after you add on some local taxes, water and bonds, and et cetera, that'll raise that number. But just the base tax rate before the local municipalities come in, runs about 0.67. So if you take a $300,000 house, and let's just do this for giggles, $300,000 house would be a $30,000 base times 0.67. You know, your taxes are $2,000. In this case, you can see that the FCV came in at 24160 and your tax amount is $1,520. So again, the big difference is uh, versus California that they're not doing it on your purchase price. And that's good news. There are some other things to look at too that you can check with. And there are some exemptions. Um, if you're a, a widow or a widower, you can get a break on your taxes. Um, over 65, 
I believe there's a proposition out there that uh, you don't pay any taxes at all. Um, at what age do you stop paying property taxes, 65 and older? So take a look at that and make sure that none of that has changed. So we have some of the lowest property tax rates in the country, and that's what makes Arizona so attractive. And I think the good news is, is that they don't tend to spike up on us. So not like what I've seen in Washington State and in California where Proposition 13 was formed because in the 80s, people, you know, house prices were going up. Remember, they called it the Gold Coast. So you're retired and you're sitting there and you've paid off your mortgage, but your taxes kept climbing, climbing, climbing. And they were pricing people out of their house. So this guy named Jarvis came along and said, he pushed this Proposition 13 that said, hey, we're going to cap it. As long as you live there, you're going to be taxed on your assessed value or your purchase price. They've massaged it a little bit over the decades, but at the time, if you paid $125,000 for the house, that was your tax rate, and it stayed with you until you sold. Great news if you're retired, bad news if you're waiting for more listings to come on, because who wants to move, right? You're going to sell that house, and now you're going to buy another one for you know, nine hundred thousand dollars, you're gonna get your brains taxed out. So that one gets kind of tough. So what's going on in our market here right now? Let's take a peek. Uh, this is a Cromford Market Index showing uh, uh, the total market index is going down, but it's still at four sixty-five. Everything over one hundred is considered a balanced market. We're nowhere near that, but you can see that demand has been going down steadily from one twenty almost to what we consider balanced. We're sitting here. At 113 and demand's quite simply backing off because uh, we just can't find anything now uh, the supply is coming down slightly the supply index so overall when you look at the market see these little gauges here green means uh supply is really low it's good for sellers market index means it's a really robust market it's green demand is almost in the yellow which is considered balanced and normal there are some things going on out there that we can take a peek at and uh, this is one of my handy-dandy little eye charts. But it shows that normal non-multiple listing service dollar volume was up 40% from $431 million to $603 million. That's iBuyers, folks. When Open Door buys your home, it doesn't hit the MLS. When OfferPad buys your home or when investors buy your home and they just come in and buy it, they, they never listed it on the MLS. They just purchased it outright from you. That's up 40%. That's a significant number. But they turn around and sell them. So investor flip dollar volume was up 154% from $250 million to $635 million. Distressed sale dollar volume was flat at $28 million. And it says here, like I just stated, in iBuyers tend to have normal non-multiple listing service purchases followed by an investor flip. So the rise in these numbers is partially due to the ramp up in transactions from iBuyers. There is also clear evidence that more transactions are happening without hitting the MLS. This reflects high levels of investor activity. So the investors are out there, they're gobbling them up, and it's showing up in non-MLS data through the county records. So... Um, that's going to back off one of these days, but right now it isn't. Now, interest rates, boy, we had a good Monday. It was looking great. Went down below 4%. Now, on the national average, we're sitting at 4.24. Um, so, we jumped back up. That's going to be an interesting one to watch. Um, how far can that continue? How long will rates continue to go up? Um, if I look at Mortgage News Daily, their consensus, we're going to touch on it here in a minute, is that they think we've pretty much peaked. So, but... You know, nothing like a war to mess things up. Here's an interesting article. Consumers still don't get it when it comes to home prices and rates. And uh, we're not beating people up, but this is a survey that was conducted by Fannie Mae, a national housing survey. And they're saying that a net of 39% of respondents thought home prices would continue to go up in early 2020. A few short months later, they were convinced that home prices would fall. They surveyed people at the beginning of 2021 and they said oh no prices are going to go down they can't stay this high and uh we all know that was wrong from that point on the net percent of those who thought prices would never return to the 39 percent pre-pandemic high all this despite months of record-setting home price appreciation so this is the chart here so here's the survey here in 2020 at 39 percent of people thought the prices were going to go up and that dropped to 30 percent 
getting over into 2022 in February. So people are still saying, nope. A third of you are saying, no, they're not going up any farther. This is it. We thought we'd turned a corner by early 2021. Uh, it was wrong. And now a record high share of consumers expect mortgage rates to increase. Look at this. You expect them to keep going up, up, and up. And it says here, indeed, rates could continue to go up, but the magnitude of any additional increase is not proportional to these consumer expectations. Rates have risen in response to the Fed shift in monetary policy. Mortgage rates are able to react to that shift quickly, whereas it will take the Fed more than a year to get where it's going. And by then, the outlook could easily change again. So all this chatter that you're hearing about the Fed raising the benchmark rates and stuff, that takes time for that to roll into the market. It doesn't just snap a finger in this change. And he's showing here, he's comparing here to... Um, 2018 when they raised rates and uh, and where we are today. It's kind of a confusing chart. Um, average expected percent change over the next 12 months is again showing that people think that uh, um, home prices are going um, up 3%. Um, and it's interesting because it says renters are screwed as far as survey respondents are concerned, but those same respondents have woefully undershot home price appreciation expectations. They've continued to say that 2% a year in a world where prices were rising 15 to 20% a year. So renters, when they were surveyed, said home prices are going to go up 2 to 3%. Well, they were off about as much as Case Schiller, who said they were going to go down 1.3, and we start, shot up about 29%. Respondents who say it's a good time to buy, eh, we're down about 38%. Respondents say it's a good time to sell, we're at 50%. So, and then it says, please sell your home. Respondents who say their household income is, compared to 12 months ago, 15%. I mean, we're at this baseline here. For all the reports we've seen ex suggesting extremely strong rate, rate wage growth, it's ironic that at no time since the pandemic, has a higher percentage of Fannie surveyed consumers reported their 12 months of income was higher than it was before the pandemic. So the survey is saying, are you making more money now than you were before the pandemic? And across the board, they're saying, nope. So again, there's always devil in the details when you look at the news, and that's an interesting number. Now we've got uh, the inflation number came out this morning at 7.9%, and that 7.9% didn't include food and energy. Gee, what a shock. So... Uh, that number is certainly not showing any relief. And unfortunately, as the Fed comes in and tries to raise rates and tamp down and get control of inflation, like I said the other day, it's been completely ripped out of his hands. You know, the, the, our central bank cannot control the price of wheat. They can't control the price of oil. There's nothing they can do about that. And the price of wheat went up 40% in one week. You're going to see that in beef prices you're going to be eating less hamaker and less steak so go out and get some of that tonight and start freezing it's going to be brutal out there and as far as fuel prices we're up at over 135 dollars a barrel now which is staggering and the charts are showing that 200 dollars a barrel is possible and that's between six and seven hundred six and seven dollars a gallon for gas i'm really distressed about that i've got a big summer trip planned where i was going to put on like three thousand miles I don't know. I'm rethinking it. So we'll see what happens. So I hate to end on bad news, but the weather's going to be fantastic today. Get out there and enjoy the day. And I will see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock with a special guest. So don't forget to turn tune in as we look at the mortgage market. Take care.